It is interesting to look back and revisit the time when the old world set out to discover the new. We learn from authorities like William Parry, J. S. Furnival and D. K. Fieldhouse that when the old world had an exportable surplus of men, money and material, a search began for the new world. Spain and Portugal led the race. England and Holland followed soon. It was in 1492 Ferdinand and Isabella, the king and queen of Spain, sponsored Christopher Columbus to go to the new land. Columbus set sail across the Atlantic in search of a quicker route to Asia and hit the Caribbean islands thinking he had discovered India. But he was indeed on the other side of the world. The illusion persisted even when he returned to the same shores in 1496. The Spaniard Amarigo Vespucci corrected this mistake finally. He was also sponsored by Spain. When he reached the shores of the new land, he knew for certain that it was a different continent altogether and not India. And thus, this new world came to be known as the Americas, from his name, Amarigo Vespucci. It was no doubt that Christopher Columbus first discovered North America, but the credit for discovering the economic potential of the land goes to two English adventurers, Walter Raleigh and Francis Drake. They came to the Americas and reported back home during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I that beyond the Atlantic there were territories which could be commercially exploited for profit. When this knowledge of the new world came to be known to the continent, to England particularly, we find that many people became eager to go and settle in the new world. Particularly at that time, the, there was a rural surplus the, because of the uh, commercial agriculture and particularly in England the enclosure system which had evicted many uh, peasants from their hearth and home and wool trade, wool farming had started in England. Because of this, this surplus rural labor, they wanted to find a new home. We find from an account of historian Trevelyan, England under the Stuarts, that yearly 30,000 people were making a move to the United States, to, to the Americas at that time. Apart from these individuals, there were many companies which took many people from England to the shores of America at different times. One such company was known as the Virginia Company, which mainly targeted Virginia as its destination. Another was the Massachusetts Bay Company. Their target was also North America. And there was a small company called Plymouth Company. They mainly promoted Puritans to the new shores of the United States. The Mayflower transported the Pilgrim Fathers from the Plymouth Harbour, England, to the port now known as Provincetown, Massachusetts. They established their first settlement in Massachusetts by virtue of the Mayflower Compact. The Massachusetts state was begun in this way. Originally, people from Britain had established 13 colonies in North America. Out of these 13, the Massachusetts Bay Company owned five colonies in the North, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhodes Island, Delaware and Maryland. Then further down, the territories previously known as New Netherland was taken away from the Dutch authority and the new colonies of New York, New Jersey and New Hampshire were created. 
Further south, on the eastern coast, there were Pennsylvania and Virginia. And then further down, through the Midlands to the south, North Carolina and South Carolina were established. And the 13th colony in this chain was Georgia. In this way, colonial America came into being. Early residents of these 13 colonies were mostly peasants or Puritans. They were mostly the underdogs of the old continental society. They were persecuted politically, economically and religiously in the old world and they thought they would have liberation, emancipation if they moved to the new world. Most of them came in search of new hope to set up their own society, own government and establish their own economy in the new world. Initially, there was abundance of land and scarcity of people in the new world. They realized for the fullest utilization of this opportunity they needed cheap labor to run the plantations, run the factories and clear the jungles. Therefore, they started importing black people from Africa. British planters caught these blacks and put them into the hatch of their vessels as if they were transporting livestock. They brought them to the ports of Boston and New York and sold them for a trifling ten pounds a man. Enslaved, these men were then transported again, particularly to the south, where they were forced to work on the huge cotton, sugar and tobacco plantations. American cotton had long yarn and it was the best in the world. Therefore, it was very much in demand from the British as well as all the other continental mills. Thus, this slave-based plantation economy fetched an enormous profit, but was, however, definitely inhuman. In the North, at that time, not many industries had come up. Maritime trade with the continent was the only form of commerce. Some of these sailors were even trading with China and Japan. America also produced a number of eminent businessmen during this period. Among them, Peter Fenwell was the first important businessman who started from slave trade but later on switched to maritime trade of all descriptions. After Peter Fenwell, we can name Hancock and Wharton, who were from Boston. The names of Willinus and Morris from Pennsylvania also deserve special mention here. They were successful businessmen and they had enormous wealth owing to the worldwide operations. Incidentally, we also had one or two American businessmen coming to India as well during this period. One of them was Benjamin Joy, who stayed in India till the end of the 18th century. There were also others who did this kind of trade from America. There was a class of American merchants, businessmen, who had become powerful, who had become wealthy, who had become influential. Now, they began contesting the hegemony, the domination of mercantilist economy policy of Great Britain over the colonies. Great Britain had shackled the colonial economy with their mercantile operations. It was evident in several instances. First of all, the colonies were only allowed to export the raw materials. They were not allowed to send any manufacture to the mother country. Great Britain used to absorb whatever they would of this raw material for their factories, mills and other, other areas. Rest of them, they retailed in the continent itself as merchants. 
for imports they had to import only the manufactured goods of England produced in the factories and mills of England itself. They were not allowed to go for a cheaper deal with France or Holland or any other country. Prices are all determined, whether it is export or import, prices are all determined by the British authorities, the colonial masters. And in this way, they had to take the manufactured goods as import from the mother country. There were specific laws at that time. These were called navigation acts by which they were not allowed to manufacture any kind of finished products. And this was a great taboo. The country had enough of natural resources, enough of talent, enough of labor to go for manufacture. Like we know in India also the same thing happened. Britain wanted to throttle our uh, industrial prospects. Therefore, we were not allowed to go for manufacture. Though we had every kind of potential to go for manufacture and industrial revolution. Here, before India, that was a practice in the colonies. They were not allowed to manufacture any goods. The fourth area of restriction through the acts of navigation was in the field of shipping. They had to use only British shipping, British clippers for carrying commodities from England to America and America to England. There had to be all shipping companies from England. Though the Americans could produce their own ships, they had already produced their own ships, their own fleet to go all over the world, yet they were restricted from carrying their own goods to the mother country or carrying goods from mother country to the colonies in their own ships. They had to use British vessels and pay the freight charges. So this was another big restriction. Apart from this fourfold restriction of mercantilism, there is another thing which is part and parcel of this kind of um, economy and that was by law, by a proclamation of the Queen, the Americans were not allowed to go to the Wild West. They were confined to the eastern coast only and they were not allowed to go into Midwest and clear the jungle and add more arable land to the existing one. This was another rest restriction for which the America wanted to expand but they were not allowed to expand at all. We can say that this is something uh, of a restriction, this, uh, this mercantilism virtually throttled all American enterprise. They had every kind of potential, they had best of natural resources, best of labor, including slave labor, best of inventive genius, yet they were not allowed to expand in any way. They were feeling totally shackled, totally throttled, a situation w which we can describe through the law of physics, expand or explode. They were in a very explosive situation at this moment. Therefore, we see that a situation had come when the American rising bourgeoisie, they were face to face with the British capitalists and mercantilist colonial masters. So, this is a situation of revolution actually. Many American writers, including Bernard Balin, have tried to project the American Revolution as an ideological conflict. According to them, the revolutionary situation was created because of the ideological differences regarding the justifiability of the laws through which Britain was maintaining its grip over the 13 colonies. America was open country. It was a frontier society. The actual distinctions between different layers of society were very few, whereas in Britain the situation was very different. Uh, there was an aristocracy, there was a well-ordered government, and 
In fact, social mobility was much slower than it was in the United States. So there is an argument that people had ceased to understand each other across the two sides of the Atlantic. This is not wholly an argument that can be taken without any qualifications in the sense that all the American colonies were not the same. There were certain American colonies that were crown colonies, as in the case of Virginia or Carolina or Georgia. In these particular cases, quite clearly, there were tiers of society that were associated with gentrification, with hierarchy and with privilege, very much as they were in Britain. On the other hand, there were more open and uh, equal societies as you find in New England. But one thing is true, which is that the sense of government and the sense of openness which existed in the United States, the sense of opportunity, was on a very, very different scale from the one which existed in England. Americans were susceptible to the radical ideas of the Enlightenment. They had interesting notions concerning voting patterns, representation and equality, ideas which were actually considered in Britain to be unacceptable. Therefore, one must accept, along with Daniel Boston, the great American historian of the 1970s, that certainly two societies had formed by the time of the American Revolution, and they were not in communication with each other seriously. Before 1776, many pamphlets were written as a popular propaganda medium. Most of them were basically arguing for basic freedom. By basic freedom, as we find later on in the Declaration of Independence, they meant life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. Jefferson took this from the two treaties on government by John Locke, who had written the book to justify the glorious revolution. So America foran the three basic requirements of capitalism, free capital, free labor, and free thought, as standardized later by Adam Smith in the 18th century in his book, Wealth of Nations. They were fighting for and clamoring for the same thing, free capital, free labor, minus the slave labor, of course, and free thought. The famous American revolutionary slogan, no taxation without representation, seems to be a direct outcome of this. These ideas simply did not arise from the economic requirements of the period. Ideological inspiration provided through pamphlets and theaters also played a very important role in this process. The American bourgeoisie had a close alliance with the professional class in America, who were the lawyers, who provided the ideological leadership of the revolution. There are many lawyers, we find, who had been the spokesman of the revolution. We have James Otis, we have Patrick Henry, we have Sam Jennings, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, all these people were actually lawyers who were spokesmen of the bourgeois community in America. They are spoken for freedom. One can say, of course, George Washington was a commander, a military genius. Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence, was a gentleman farmer. So they were not lawyers, but nevertheless, they had intimate connection with the lawyers. They put up the lawyers as their representatives. The marching class and the lawyer class, professionals, they combined. They were the avant-garde of the revolution. They were the people who made the revolution of 1776. Of course, there, were, there was the French influence in it. Uh, there was one man, Thomas Paine. He was an American who wrote The Age of Reason and also Common Sense as a pamphlet. He was a very famous man whose thoughts influenced 
the Americans very much. And another person who had influenced American history of the revolutionary period was French General Lafayette. Lafayette was a staunch supporter of the American Revolution and he had trained American uh, fighters for freedom. So the French had also a role to play in the American Revolution. So when we analyze the classes involved in the revolution, we mostly have, uh, first of all, the American capitalists. They were the main stay of the revolution. Their spokesmen, all the lawyers that I have mentioned so far, they were there. And of course, planters, they were there. Planters, farmers, mechanics and laborers, as later Andrew Jackson used to say. These are the people who had made the revolution. So when the actual fight came, all these people would join, all these whites would join. They wanted in the first place freedom from the clutches of the mother country. Their economic hold, their political hold. Americans had no representation in the British Parliament. Though the British government by remote control controlled the American government, no doubt about that. They used to send governors to the colonies. All the uh, regulations were passed in the British Parliament, but the Americans had no representatives there. And that was one question, that they had no representation. So what kind of freedom they had? No freedom at all. The laws were passed arbitrarily. And because of this, when the revolution was imminent, we know that Edmund Burke had given his speeches on the conciliation with America in the British Parliament. He had pointed out that there would be no configuration there would be no revolution in America if the Americans were given good representation in the British Parliament. He believed in trusteeship. He believed that if the Americans were given adequate representation in the British Parliament, there would be no revolution. I wouldn't subscribe to that kind of view. Revolution was on a major contradiction. These are minor contradictions. Major contradiction was the economic contradiction. The American Bourgeoisie wanted the independent capitalism, capitalist growth, which was stunted by British mercantilism. Unless the British authorities were overthrown, the colonial shackle over American economy would not go. So basically, this was the fundamental conflict for which the revolution had come. So this had to be overthrown in the first place. Therefore, it was not by giving representation to the Americans the British Parliament that this conflict could be resolved. This conflict could not be resolved. So ultimately, I would say that the revolution was inevitable and it had to come someday or other. We know that in America, um, in the United States, recent hist uh, historiography has uh, produced another school who are called the New Left School. There is one Jameson, who interprets American Revolution in a different way. They categorically say what I have just now said, that American Revolution was basically a bourgeois democratic revolution. Common people had no place in it. They were cannon fodder, all right, but they had no place in it. It was a revolution of the bourgeois, by the bourgeois, and for the bourgeois. That was the American Revolution, according to Jameson and people of his school. Truly speaking, we cannot say that it's a very popular vision that all kinds of people joined in. All kinds of people joined in and uh, grassroots participated heavily in this revolution. It's, the story is not like that. The Revolutionary Army was fought, no doubt, but led by the, the gentleman farmer like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, or some lawyers, some businessmen in the North. Common people were recruited as if they were hired labor. They joined it and fighting was on. It is spread from north to south very fast. We know that uh, it had started in near about Boston, in Massachusetts. Fighting had taken place in battlefields like Concord or Lexington. Then it had gone further south and there was this major fight in Camp Valley Forge. And Americans being in the home ground, 
and they uh, were acclimatized in, in American weather. The British troops who had come were no match for the Americans. In, in times of struggle, in bitter winter, it was the perseverance and the power to beat the weather that the Americans were better than the British Army. Ultimately, the British were defeated. It was mainly a fight of patience and perseverance. Who would wear the other side out? And George Washington led the American Revolution Army with historic grit. He could successfully stand on his ground and ultimately the British were tired, exhausted, they had run out of the resources and the Americans stood there with historic grit and they could finally beat the British troops. In this way the revolution had been concluded in 1776 after the British had surrendered, Declaration of Independence was there and Declaration of Independence, of course, George Washington was a first-rate uh, commander-in-chief, first-rate leader, but no ideologue. I would like to conclude this discourse on a different note. I would like to say that this revolution was basically a white revolution because the slaves, the blacks, were beyond the pale of this revolution. They didn't even know what was happening uh, above their head. The Red Indian people, the original people of the United States, they were also outside the scene of activity of the revolution. They were completely cast aside from the main course of the revolution. So for them, it didn't mean whether it was a revolution for freedom or a revolution for free capitalism. They didn't understand head or tail about it. Therefore, you cannot call it a total American revolution of all people. Basically, therefore, I would maintain that it was a white revolution. More so, when we come to the next discourse about the making of the Constitution. But that that will be next time.